into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Two things, two things clearly given us that are threats, that are dangers to our Christian walk and our obedience and discipleship under Christ, that is temptation and evil or the evil one. I prefer the translation evil one, and so that'll be the way that uh, at least I teach out on this will be we're being called to petition God to deliver us from the power, the influence, the, the clutches, if you will, of the evil one. Allow us to be spared from difficult circumstances that would tempt us to sin. I've got this from the ESV study Bible. Another sentence of clarifying or clarification is offered. The best protection from sin and temptation and the evil one is to turn to God and to depend on his direction. Now, this line here is in fact quite challenging and has stumped many Christians with confusion. The line is, and lead us not into temptation. Because the Bible says very clearly, very explicitly, I'll give you the reference to that. It's James, let me find it here exactly, I just of course lost my spot. James chapter 113, God never directly tempts believers. God cannot be tempted with evil and God will not tempt us with evil. In fact, it was only just recently that uh, the Pope, Pope Francis, came out and actually gave uh, something of a, of a rendition, a new rendition of this petition with his own argument that we cannot pray this prayer, God lead us not into temptation. He argued that that's always been wrong. It should never have prayed that way. That's not what Jesus intended. And that all modern translations that render it such, that they're wrong. In fact, I'll pull this up here in an article so I can reference uh, Pope Francis's words of changing the Lord's Prayer, the phrase, lead us not into temptation. Under the direction of Pope Francis, let me read it directly from this news article that, that I found. This goes back to the, the back end of 2018. Some of you may have seen this in the secular news and some of you may not. It says that there will soon be a change to the verbiage in the Lord's Prayer to clarify that God does in fact not tempt people. The Pope has taken issue with the phrase, lead us not into temptation. This is one prayer in the, in the one line in the Lord's Prayer. According to the Daily Express, experts have been studying the biblical text for 16 years and they recently concluded from a theological, pastoral and stylistic viewpoint that the centuries old wording used in English translations is incorrect. Let me restate that. This is important. According to the Vatican, from a theological pastoral and stylistic standpoint viewpoint that rendering is wrong what what was lacking from that stylistic theological pastoral what was lacking a linguistic and exegetical standpoint what what do we want to know I, I'm going to start preaching and get away from the article but this is what bothers me about this is I don't come to the Bible and certain phrases and certain lines and verses and statements in scripture and I feel like they are up for modification if they're stylistically unpalatable or if they're pastorally problematic or if they're theologically not going to fit into our neat and tidy framework of how we systematize God's truth. None of those things are valid reasons to be modifying with the text of Scripture. But of course, the Pope has gone on record at the end of 2018 saying, this translation is incorrect. We should not pray. We would never pray, lead us not into temptation. But rather, the translation of the line, and I don't know if there's been a, a formal ex cathedra Vatican edict on this just yet, but here's the words of the Pope. He said that the phrasing should be not lead us into lead us not into temptation, but rather here's the here's the new option: abandon us not when in temptation. The shift in language comes after after one year. The Pontiff argued that the wording is not a good translation. The Pope went on to explain his own viewpoint. He said this. A father doesn't do that. A father helps you to get up immediately, Francis said. He, he said with the, the line in question, if it's Satan who leads us into temptation. That's, that's his department. And so then the question arises, do we, do we really have this right to do this to the Bible? Do we, do we really have this option to come to the text of Scripture and say things like, I'm uncomfortable with the wording here. It's... it's it's not clear, it's confusing and, and challenging. It, it, it needs to be reworded, remodeled, rephrased. And 
Of course, I would argue with my high view of Scripture that we are always servants of the Word. The Word is never a servant to us. The, we are always under the mastery of the Word in our life. We never stand as masters over the Word. It's true. It's true that God doesn't tempt us with evil and God cannot be tempted with evil, but a, a closer rendering and, and reading and understanding of this clause shows that there isn't really any major conflict at all. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. God never directly tempts believers, but God's leading, God's leading can at times bring us into temptation at the hands of Satan, sin, and self. Satan, sin, and self. If, if, if you're curious where we might see that in the Bible without going too deep into the, in the Scripture itself, I would just simply offer you the example of Jesus Christ, where, where his testing was perhaps most worse, where temptation and the evil one came personally to Jesus, while in the wilderness, you can't read your Bible without reading exactly, after Christ's baptism, the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness, where he would encounter temptation, testing, and trial at the hand of the evil one. So, of course, God may at times lead us into circumstances where the testing of our faith produces perseverance. And, and like James says in chapter 1 of his epistle, we would count it all joy when we undergo various trials and sufferings and afflictions. But we have every right to pray this prayer. Lord, lead us not. Lead us in paths of safety. Lead us in paths away from temptation and help us to be protected from the evil one. Here's the rub. Getting into the into the, the essence of this petition, we have to remember that this prayer contains petitions which are of the gravest importance. If we, if we had time and we don't in this short series in the Lord's Prayer, we might be just as fascinated as looking at the things Jesus did not give us to pray for. The things that Jesus did not include. He speaks of, he speaks of praying, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day a daily bread. Forgive us our sins, our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. It is a notoriously brief prayer. What that means is every single petition is of the gravest importance. It's of the most serious consideration. What that means is this is a very dangerous world, and Christians are in a terribly high-risk predicament. I wonder, I truly wonder, if Christians of our modern age and our modern day have genuinely reckoned with the, the reality of the threat around us. For Jesus to put this at the back end of the prayer, alongside us praying for the day, a daily bread, forgiveness of sins, the holiness of God's name to be on display and God's kingdom to come and, and nestled at the back of, of all that incredible prayer is, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. It's discovered today, in fact, just, uh, just recently one of, the, one of the elders here at Malcolm handed me a, a great book by... Uh, by a, a, an author of our day, I feel like I best not mention his name, but a very challenging book called Dangerous Calling. And, and, and you can look it up, and, and if you're curious, I, I recommend it. It's a, it's a profound book about how being in ministry is a dangerous calling. How the temptations, the attacks, the onslaughts of all that the enemy has, and all of the flesh of people in churches, and just the fallenness of humanity... They rail against those that are in ministry. And this, this, this book is a, a couple hundred pages of encouragement and advice to, to just survive in ministry. Some of you may not realize the height of the attrition rate of people in vocational ministry is staggering. And, and, and perhaps the worst among all, all professions in the modern day. It truly is that dangerous. And this book was written... And on the back of this book, of its original edition... In fact, I took a screenshot of this today... On the back of this book were five endorsements from five men who led what would technically be clarified as a megachurch. So that's 2,000 or plus regular attendees. Five men who were, who were at least on the broader evangelical scheme as men of notoriety and influence and importance. Of those five men, when this book was first published only a few years ago, of those five men who were on the back of this book, Dangerous Calling, three of them, are not in ministry 
today. In fact, one of them, just last week, completely repudiated the Christian faith. Completely. Completely. You can go look this up. If you've got, if you've got Google, you can, you can just simply do a search on this and, and find this out. How staggering is it on a book that directly targets the issue of how dangerous ministry is. You have the biggest bullseye right between your eyes if you stand for Christ, and especially if you stand for Christ behind a pulpit. And and this book, Dangerous Calling, is a a well-weighted, wise book, and three-fifths of the endorsement, those men are not in ministry today, sacked from their churches. A grave scandal, sexual sin, impropriety, you name it, it happens. It's dangerous, it's scandalous, it's shocking. Why do I say that? You may sit there thinking, what, what relation does that have to me? I mean, Craig, you're the preacher, we're, the, we're not, so maybe that's not so relevant. But, but, but just, to, just to have this weight bear down on you, Jesus would not have included this in the prayer, the briefest of prayers. He would not have included this petition if it wasn't of gravest importance. Do we pray this? Do we regularly Pray, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. First John chapter 2, let me give you three verses here, 15, 16, and 17 of First John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's the basic premise of all Christianity. We're called upon to pray this. We're called upon to believe this. The world out there is a dangerous place. Satan is a tremendously formidable foe, and the the sin that dwells within, the the sinful nature of the flesh, the, the Adamic nature that clings to us all, is ready at any point to trip us up and cause us to be addicted in sin, enslaved to sin. I wonder if perhaps it's, um, it's symptomatic of our generation or, or may, maybe even stronger language is needed. There's, there's an epidemic of our own day that, that we just don't recognize how serious a threat there is in Satan or in temptation. Why like Jesus would ask us to pray this, you know, In former times, Christians that have recognized the great threat against them have contrived a myriad of weird and wonderful measures for protection. If you've ever studied the history of asceticism, then you know just how mind-boggling it can be. Let me give you some examples. Give you some examples. And these are all foolish examples. I don't want you to think at any point that, that, that there is any condoning from me of these things. But I want you to get a sense of how serious Christians in, in centuries gone by have believed the risk out there truly was and the measures that they went to protect themselves against temptation and the evil one. This is going to get weirder as we go. The first category of people are called the, the flagellants either as a monastic form or penance for sins, people would try and subdue their flesh by flagellation. They would, they would whip themselves until they bled. Often they would form lines in a parade in hundreds and sometimes more and whip themselves and they marched from town to town, village to village, singing hymns and calling sinners to join the, join the parade. The first recorded outbreak of this phenomenon took place in 1260. 1260. Christians would do this because they felt like to subdue the flesh, they had to beat themselves. Now, I know it's easy to sit there and say insanity, stupidity, foolishness. My my reason for bringing this is not to condone, as I'd already said, but to give you a sense of how Christians have in the past felt the the foreboding warning of the threat. Now, from the painful to the outright putrid, those of you with perhaps weaker stomachs can block your ears and look away. There was a movement somewhere in the Middle Ages. I'm even (laughs) tempted just to skip past this. This is so horrible. Pus drinking and scab eating ascetics. I warned you. Here's the rundown. The general populace, particularly in continental Europe, despise lepers, that's those with open skin sores, 
and the appearance of this disease. And so as an act of humility, many female saints, now sainted by the Catholic Church, such as St. Catherine, would care for these untouchables by, brace yourself or block your ears, ready, by licking away the pus in the wounds of lepers and eating the scabs. And people considered these to be exceptionally holy. Okay. From the putrid to the outright peculiar. The stylite monks. You remember the stylite monks? Technically hermits rather than monks. These men would, from the earliest centuries of Christianity through the Middle Ages, this was an ongoing phenomenon, they would climb a ladder to the top of a ruined Roman column, sit down, often in a, in a space of territory about the size of this small table you see here, they would sit down, kick the ladder away, and vow to remain there, contemplating God until they died. There are accounts of these type of monks, stylite monks, who survived as long as 20 years, relying on handouts from strangers who would pass by, and they would pole food and, and water up to the, the hermit on the top of the pole. Now the name, Stylite, comes from St. Simeon Stylitus, or Simon the Stylite, born in AD 390, so this stretches right back to the patristic period, or close to it. He was a Syriac ascetic saint. He achieved notability for living, hear this, 37 years on a small platform at the top of a pole near Aleppo of Syria to escape, to escape the world, to, to escape the temptation and, and the evil one. They would climb these poles and stay there until they died. I wonder how. Maybe I shouldn't, but I wonder how they slept, how they went to the bathroom. I don't know. I'm just, just leave that alone. The, Let's look at the last one. I've got a page of examples. I'm just trying to find the ones that bring home the point with as much force as possible. The anchorites. Maybe you've heard of the anchorite hermits. They would take funeral rites. They would wash themselves in holy water and allow themselves to be sealed up in a wall, usually inside a church enclosure. And like the starlight monks we mentioned at the top of the pole, they would rely on God to provide for them with food and water and the kindness of passerbyers without ever coming outside of their, their coffin inside the wall. The mystic Julian of Norwich is one of the most famous of these anchorites. Now it's easy for us to go through that list and maybe on the one hand have a chuckle and a laugh and think, well, that's comical, and some of it is. And on the other hand, think it's just downright disgusting and foolish and totally non-civilized and primitive and Neanderthalic, and in some sense, it is. But the lengths that these believers were trying to go to, to escape, to, to, to preserve themselves against these threats that daily bombard the Christian. Now, it is foolish, right? Because escaping the actual world doesn't mean we've escaped temptation or the evil one, right? I mean, are they reading their Bible, I wonder? Jesus was in the desert by himself when he suffered one of the most satanic of all temptations he received. Did no one read that story in the Bible? And how many of us know that being alone is no way to escape temptation? In fact, I would say even some of us here in the church right now undergo our strongest temptations when we are alone. But what these ascetics get credit for, and they do get some credit. I, I'm not condoning their actions, and, I, and I've got real questions about their theology and their, their use of the Bible. But, but what they do get credit for is their appreciation for just how dangerous temptation and the evil one are. They took radical action because they understood the radical nature of the threats. And I, I suspect that we often don't take radical action because we don't often appreciate the radical nature of the threat. And radical action would not look anything like what we've just described. As the early monastic movement began to gain traction in the early centuries of the Christian church, it became very apparent 
Very apparent to those that left the cities and left civilization as it was in those days to, to go and hermit themselves in caves and dens of the earth. And some of them would live in trees for, for years and others, as we've just read at the top of poles. What, what all of them soon learned is that temptation and lust dwell just as much within as they do without. And Satan can't be warded off by a wall or a pole or any such thing. So what's the application? This is as simple as it gets. It's pray, of course. Pray. Pray this petition. Father, who is holy and in heaven, all glorious and all sovereign, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. We're called to pray as Jesus did and we're called to be sustained by God's power through God's means of grace. God's means of grace. What the scripture doesn't list and doesn't explicitly mention as a, as a means of grace is to escape the world, escape the community, escape the cities. That's not scriptural. In fact, the Bible would tell us to go into all the world, highways and byways, hedges and homes and villages and towns to proclaim Jesus. We are not called to escape the world as if that was a way we could, we could radically remove ourselves from Satan and temptation. We are called to pray. It's in the Lord's Prayer that we ought to pray this. I would, I would ask you to just, even in your own heart, think through how many times you've prayed this prayer. Lead us not into temptation. I think sometimes we take for granted our strength, our, our boasted ability to resist temptation, that of all these petitions that the prayer asks us to pray, maybe we pray all the other ones and maybe we seldom pray this one. And maybe, maybe that's the case because we haven't, like the ascetics, like these hermits, we haven't really factored in just how serious Satan's onslaughts and sin's temptations are. So pray. That's the first application. There's only two. We'll get through this fairly quick. The first one is pray. That's what Jesus said to do. And that's in fact what Jesus did. Prayed for himself and prayed, of course, for his disciples. He prayed that they wouldn't be extracted from the world, but they would be kept in the world and kept from the world while dwelling in the world. And we think of the example, even Peter, the apostle. Jesus came to Peter and said, Hey, Peter, Satan has asked to take you and sift you like wheat. I don't know about you. I'm going to be quite frank with you and just tell you here this evening that, that if I'm there and, and, and I'm Peter and Jesus comes and says that to me, I feel like my reply to Jesus is, why would you tell me? I'd rather not know. I'd rather you not say that. Jesus says, hey, hey, by the way, Peter, tap on the shoulder. Satan's coming to try and have his way with you. I feel like that's something I wouldn't want to know. But of course, Jesus told this to Peter so he could be on guard. And then what did Jesus say? But I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. And when you return, when you are restored, of course, Peter denied Christ. He, 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 cursed, his, his, he, he cursed to the, the young girl by the fire. He, he cursed his allegiance to Jesus. Of course, Peter fell, but he did return. He was restored. And Jesus prayed. Don't underestimate the power of prayer to pray. Lead us not into temptation. And deliver us from the evil one. Acknowledge the threat. Don't be so foolish as to run headlong where angels fear to tread. Don't do that. What's my reference there? Well, maybe you could pick it up in the reference. It's Jude chapter 1, verse 9. You're welcome to turn there if you like. I'm going to read this single verse here. Jude chapter 1, verse 9. We've just worked our way, uh, going back a couple of months now, on a five-part series on angels. And if we learned anything about these beings, angels, we learned that they are tremendous warriors of, of great power and great strength and, and great knowledge with great warlike tendencies and capabilities. We learned that about angels. So this is a compelling verse in Jude chapter 1, verse 9. It says this, but when the angel, sorry, but when the archangel Michael contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses. He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. 
The Lord rebuke you. Now, now Jude has a main point, but it's one of those instances in Scripture where you feel like, Jude, you could have taken a few lines to give us some more detail as to exactly what you're talking about here. Some commentators and scholars believe that possibly after the death of Moses and, of course, his soul went to glory, to his reward, that, that the devil came and, 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 and perhaps he wanted to take the body of Moses to use it for malicious purposes, maybe, maybe to reanimate it or possess it in some, in some dark spiritual way to go back to the people of Israel and say, don't listen to anything I said, don't, don't obey the law, the whole Sinai thing was a, was a charade, don't, don't believe it, M- maybe that's what's going on. We, we really don't know. But whatever it is, there's a dispute now. The archangel Michael comes down and enters into a a dispute with Satan over the body of Moses. But Jude's main point is this. Even Michael, this towering warrior, archangel of great authority and strength and glory, did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment. Some of your translations say a slanderous judgment to Satan. But he simply said, the the Lord rebuke you. This is what I mean when I say this, that, that what we ought to do is have grave thoughts, intimidating thoughts, with how serious the threat is, and don't be so foolish as to run headlong where angels fear to tread, or at least where angels fear to slander. I feel like sometimes we so underplay, we so diminish and demean the arch enemy of our soul, Satan. And by that, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we ought to praise him more or credit him with more. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying he does have the capacity to appear as an angel of light and to cause the ruin of our soul in that sense that he is, he is the arch enemy of our souls. That's what the Bible says. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What does Michael do when confronted with Satan? Not foolishly, not not proudly, not arrogantly. Even Michael says, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. I think think what we learn from this as we think about these petitions, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I think what what we're to learn through this is to have a due appreciation for the threat that is daily against us in Satan, his hordes, and sin's temptations. So here's the petition laid out for us in the text of Scripture that we would, with some real sobriety, we would pray this. Lead us not into temptation. Father, deliver us from the evil one. And may God bless that to our souls. Let us go to him with a word of prayer as we close our thoughts around this, around this, the Lord's Prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together here this evening. God, I do pray a grace upon upon our time, even not just tonight, God, but as these many weeks we've walked through each of these petitions of this prayer and we've thought about what this should mean for us and how we should daily pray this and how, how we should appropriate, Lord God, your promises in relation to these petitions. If we're honest, Father, if we're humble enough to admit and confess, we are often lax. We are often perhaps unappreciative of just what threats are against us. The temptation is so close. The Adamic nature is part of us still and constantly seeks to drive us toward toward sin. Help us, Father. Help us. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And deliver us from the evil one. He seeks the ultimate ruin of our souls. He seeks to destroy, to steal, to kill. He seeks to tear us asunder individually and as a church. Father, we pray you deliver us from him. We pray you deliver us from him. We pray you rebuke him, as the archangel Michael had said. Above all, God, be glorified. Help us to pray as we ought. Help us to be deep and constant and and continuous in our prayer as we model our prayer upon this, the Lord's Prayer. We ask you to grant us that grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.